Good morning. All this uh, sweet conversation going on, hate to interrupt, but we're going to get started. Thank you all for deciding to come this morning, worship together. It is indeed a privilege to come and to gather. It is a privilege that's not enjoyed in, in every place in the world. And so we do appreciate that, the fact that we can freely come together and, and worship God in the way that, uh, that we feel convicted to do so. Um, if you're a guest with us for the first time on a Sunday morning, you should be able to find a little card in the seat back in front of you. Appreciate it. Fill that out. Drop it in one, any one of the baskets, which are near the exits. And that is also a place where we place our, our uh, tithes and offerings. I invite you to stand. I'll pray. And we're going to sing our first song, which happens to be an old hymn. Four thousand tongues to sing. Gracious God, as we come into your presence today, as a group, as a body of people who have committed themselves to you, I pray, God, that our worship of you would reflect your greatness in our hearts. You are great and awesome and powerful. Um, indescribable and Lord I pray that that uh, our hearts well up with acknowledging that and that as we do that it bubbles into worship worship of you and I pray that as we do so we find our purpose and pleasure in bringing honor and glory to your name so Lord, we pray for this time, this hour, hour and a quarter or so in which we worship, um, that everything would would serve to honor you and glorify you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. 
for all that you've done for us. We thank you that you came, you taught, you discipled, and you went to the cross, you died. It's for our sin. Lord, when you taught your disciples, when you met with them the night before the cross, you taught them and told them that it would be our love for one another that would distinguish us as your disciples. And I pray that that love would be known through our unity. May we be unified. As the scripture says there, with one voice, we would glorify you, God. Pray that, that you would give us endurance so that we may not stumble, that we may not fall, sustain us, to lean on you for our strength. Help us to focus our work on the commission that your son gave us. And as we go into the world, that we make disciples. And in that process of making disciples, that there would be unity, unity in love. Lord, I pray that our love would be evident to the world around us, that we would be salt and light, that we would that we would endure even under persecution, even when we perhaps are misunderstood. I pray that pray that our testimony to the world would be one of love and unity. Lord, I pray for how we might impact the world, whether it's at work, whether it is with our families, whether it is um, corporately. Lord, I pray that uh, I just, I just reflect on the chaos that's going on in our world today and how much we need unity. And when I talk about love, it's, you've demonstrated, Lord Jesus, it's not sort of a squishy feeling that comes and goes, but it is a sacrificial commitment. Lord, I pray that's what our love would be. We'd reflect the love that you have for us. One that looks not for ourselves and our own benefit, but that one that looks out for others. Lord, I pray for uh, Pastor Chris that he brings a message later on. May you give him wisdom. that our attention would be drawn to your word and that it would make an impression on our minds and our hearts so that we can take your message with us as we go into the world. All of these things we pray in the name of Jesus our Savior. Amen.
میشه Our featured missionary today is Adam Bailey, and uh, this email must have come out, or I should say this report must have come out a little bit before, uh, or a little bit early, because uh, I received an email from him this week that says he has 100% of his uh, support received. So he's uh, planning on going to Japan in July sometime, and uh, assuming he gets his visa and so forth. And we're also going to be blessed. Adam will, uh, he's trying to make con connections with his supporters and that sort of thing, supporting churches. So Adam will be here on June 19th to wow. tell us about uh, what he's going to be, <clears throat> to tell us what he's going to be doing in Japan. So uh, we're excited for Adam that he has the support and that uh, he's able to go. So, uh, but you'll notice there he has a number of uh, things there that he needs to get straightened out and so forth, clean up before he uh, leaves for uh, Japan in, in, in July. So, uh, so we can be praying for the transition and things that he's going to be doing. He's starting to study Japanese and so forth, which is, as I understand it, not a very easy language to learn. And so he's working on that, and uh, and he's, there's also concern that uh, that uh, Japan may not be accepting people accepting visas. So uh, uh, those are things that we need to uh, be praying about. So let's uh, pray for Adam. Gracious Father, thank you that Adam has raised support. Thank you that he's. Uh, and for a young man to make this commitment to for missions in it's just a tremendous uh, uh, just a tremendous indication of this young man's character and uh, his desire to follow you so we pray uh, uh, just for all the things that he has to uh, do and the connections that he has to make before he leaves we pray that uh, the doors will be open for him to get his visa in japan and uh, that the support that he needs probably for airplane fare and that sort of thing to get there will be available to him. And uh, we prepare him, prepare him for the ministry, the church planning ministry that he intends to do in Japan. So we uh, thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Denny. It's so exciting to see the Lord raising up people for His global cause. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen indeed. And it's wonderful to come alongside them and support them with our giving and with our prayers. Are there any other announcements? Any other announcements? Ah, oh, the potluck. <laughs> yes, food and fellowship. So we'll be having that immediately after uh, the conclusion of the service today. Any others? Well, I do have one more. We could bring up our progress bar, please. Um, we are 100% through stage two. Amen? Yeah. All right. Praise the Lord for that. All the way through stage one, which is connecting with people, all the way through stage two, which is assessing church health. Our transition team has produced an assessment report uh, giving every reader of it an understanding of all that the transition team has done through stage two. We have about a dozen copies of the assessment report right on the table by the doors. Feel free to take one and take it home and read it and digest it, pray over it. If we run out, we can always make more. It's 13 pages long, so we didn't want to print too many. But if you're interested, take the report, read it, we'll keep an eye on how the pile is going, and we will replenish it as it comes down. The, the assessment report also has seven other accompanying documents. 
We did not print those because it would have been prohibitive cost-wise. However, if you are interested in the supporting documents, get in touch with me and I will send those to you electronically. So thank you very much. You may be interested in the summary of the assessment report. It's on the final page, page 13 of it. So here is that summary. Uh, according to the IPM format, we gave five strengths, four concerns, and several recommendations. Here's what the assessment team found, the transition team found regarding our strengths. We are missions minded, i.e. Adam Bailey and all the other missionaries whom we support. Uh, we, we have a heart for Christ's global cause. That's a strength. We are, praise the Lord, financially healthy. We can go about what God has given us to do without worrying about money. Why? Because God has given our people a spirit of generosity. Thank you, church, for your generosity. Another strength is passionate spirituality. We are passionate about the things of God, and we do love God as a church. That is a huge strength that we can build on. More about that later. Sound biblical doctrine. We take this book as God's word, and we follow it, and we teach it, and we obey it. And then, a love for one another. We love one another. These are tremendous strengths that God has given our church on which we can build. The report goes on to mention some concerns because after all, no church is perfect. We have a perfect savior, but every church has room to grow. So here are some concerns. We need some small groups. We need to develop small groups. We need to develop transparent, structured leadership, meaning we need to know who's in charge of what, who does what, who leads what, and how to connect with them. We need to make new disciples. We, we need to hear within our congregation the cries of newborn babes in Christ. And then we need uh, to really reach out into our community and uh, have a community awareness, some concerns. Well, our strengths and our concerns lead to some recommendations that our team, transition team, is presenting to the church. Uh, we want to develop some generationally targeted ministries especially for seniors and grandparents that's building on the strength of our church uh, age-wise and also the demographic of our community and then uh, for students as well and by the way students is the current term for youth by students we mean junior high senior high develop biblical ministries for preempting and resolving conflict every relationship has conflict how do we lower the temperature and resolve it Initiate ways to reach our neighbors and communities. We want to get about that. Develop holistic small groups. That gets back to our concern for need of small groups. Develop an ongoing leadership pipeline so that we are constantly able to raise up new leaders in our church and then re-revise the premises use policy to make it more open to community use. So these are some recommendations that our team has brought. Now you can see how busy the team has been. Uh, this is just a summary of our strengths, our concerns, and some recommendations. And so we want to give uh, uh, you the opportunity to look at this report, the full report, as I said. It's available on the table, and uh, supporting documents are there at your request. One more thing about stage two. Many, 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 many thanks to our transition team. Uh, Tammy Richardson, Ella Sanderson, Andrea Wilson, Cindy Miller, Stephen Zemlicka, Jane and Dave Zimmerman. Thank you, Transition Team. You've done a tremendous, tremendous Every single person on the team and the whole team together has been faithful in fulfilling their commitment and have done that commitment fully and effectively and faithfully. I, I'm just so grateful for our whole transition team. Wonderful people to work with. Well, we are moving on to stage three, which is facilitating action. Some of our transition team will be joining us for that. Others, for various reasons, will not be. So we're going to be adding some new people. Why are we going through this process anyway? 
Because before we begin to search for pastors next, we need to answer two questions. First question is, who are we? The second question is, where are we going? Stages one and two, connecting with people and assessing church health, answer the first question, who are we? So now we need to begin to search out the answer for where are we going? And we'll do that by stages three and four, facilitating action and strategically planning. God is at work right now in our midst. I'm excited for what he's done in our pastoral transition. I'm looking forward to what he's going to do. But we don't want to presume on him. We need to do something that starts with a P, R, pray. We need to keep praying. The moment we are deluded to a sense of our own self-sufficiency, we will fail. We need the Lord. We need the Lord's wisdom. We need the Lord's help. We need the Lord's strength. We need the Lord's sufficiency. Thank you, church. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be a part of this process for this time. So, amen. Yes, I see some hands clapping. So. There we go. Any other announcements? Children's Church. Children's Church. That's right. It is time for Children's Church. There's Mrs. Richardson right at the door. So children, you are welcome to go to Children's Church. Uh, parents are welcome to accompany them. Anyone else? Uh, siblings, Wigglers, anyone else? Children's Church. Let's transition over into God's Word for us this morning. And let's open in prayer as we prepare to listen to God's Word. Lord, you are at work in our midst. We give you praise. We give you thanks. You are awesome. Glory to you. How wonderful you are. Lord, in this life and this earthly journey, we need your strength. We need endurance. Thank you that you supply that to us. As we open your word this morning, we pray that you would drill it deeply into our hearts, that we might be encouraged in this marathon of faith you put us in. In Christ's name, amen. It can indeed feel like a marathon. I've run only one marathon in my life, and I can tell you at about mile 17, my legs began to feel like a marathon. <coughs> to feel like a marathon. This race, or this run, through our earthly course. We can get weary, fatigued. We can feel depleted, worn out. And yet, we still have miles and miles and miles to go before we cross the finish line of this challenging run. And so we need endurance, don't we? We need endurance for this marathon of life. And so the question before us this morning is this. How can we run with endurance the race that is set before us? We discover the answer to that question in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. So if you haven't already, open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. Hebrews is a letter written to Jewish Christians who were being persecuted for their faith. And they were being tempted to go back to their previous life because they were having a struggle enduring the persecution. They're going through a trial. They're running a marathon, and it's testing their faith. And so the author of Hebrews encourages his recipients to remain true to Christ in the midst of their testing, in the midst of their trial. Now this letter to them is very much for us. 
because we also experience trials and testings throughout the course of this earthly life. So how do we endure? How do we run the race well so that we cross the finish line? Hebrews 12, 1 through 2. I'm reading from the 1995 New American Standard Translation. Let's listen to God's Word. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin that so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And so these two short verses depict the Christian life as a marathon of faith. And the finish line is the city of God, highlighted in Hebrews 11, verse 10, where Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. And the wonderful thing about this race, the wonderful thing about this marathon, is that everybody who crosses the finish line wins. Everybody wins when they cross the finish line. So how do we persevere by faith in this marathon? Or using the language of Hebrews 12, how can we run with endurance this race that is set before us? Well, as we move through our passage, we see, first of all, that we need to throw off hindrances. Hebrews 12, first part of verse 1, therefore... Since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and also the sin which so easily entangles us. Great cloud of witnesses. What is this great cloud of witnesses surrounding us? Ancient writers used the word cloud as a metaphor for a large group of people. And so in Hebrews 12, the cloud is a crowd. The cloud is a crowd, a large group of people. So this cloud is the crowd of Old Testament people of faith in the previous chapter chapter 11. And so we are surrounded by this crowd of Hebrews 11 saints who have already run their marathon of faith, who have already crossed the finish line and are now in the presence of God. Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Rahab, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, the prophets, and countless numbers of other Old Testament people. Oh, what a cloud. Oh, what a crowd. They enjoy faith's triumphs. And they endure faith's trials. They've already run their marathon of faith. They've completed the race. They've crossed the finish line. They have finished well. And their faith witnesses to us. They are witnesses not so much of us, but to us. They are witnesses to us as we run our race of faith. Their faith cheers us on. I remember when I ran that Disney marathon. I needed a crowd to cheer me on because I was faint. And their faith cheers us on as we take our turn in the race. So they 
witness to us. And their witness to us, as we run our marathon, helps to give us the endurance that we need to finish, and to finish well. And their witness demonstrates that for us to endure in the long run, we need to throw off hindrances. Now, one hindrance we need to throw off is every encumbrance, anything that would encumber us in our race. What's an encumbrance? In, in Hebrews 12, the Greek word encumbrance uh, refers to a weight. An encumbrance is a weight that impedes you in your race of faith. Have you ever seen a runner run away, run a race carrying some weights? No, they might have been lifting weights in the gym, but they don't take them on the racetrack. They throw them off. Got to run light. Lay aside every weight that might weigh you down in your race of faith. Now, a weight is not necessarily sinful in and of itself. There's anything that weighs you down, anything that hinders you, anything that slows you down or throws you off balance. And so, we each need to ask oneself, as I run my marathon of faith, is there anything in my life that is weighing me down? Anything that's hindering me? Anything that's throwing me off balance? Is there some thought or some word or some deed in my life that's weighing me down or throwing me off balance as I race toward the finish line, the city of God. If so, then let's lay aside that encumbrance. Let's remove the weight. Let's throw it off the racetrack so that we can run unencumbered. Well, that's easy to say, but what is the sticking point is the how. How do we lay aside these encumbrances? Well, we need to begin by identifying the encumbrances. What are these weights that we might be carrying as we run our marathon? We need to identify them. Have time today just for one. Our encumbrances can take the form of misplaced priorities. I mentioned that one because that's the one I struggle with. Misplaced priorities. And it's very easy to wrongly place my priorities. And that can encumber us, that can weigh us down, that can throw up off balance. Do we spend too much time on social media while our Bibles gather dust on the shelf? That's a misplaced priority. Or do we spend too much time on the couch before the TV and too little time on our knees before the throne? That's a misplaced priority. Or are we too much Martha in frantic ministry activity and too little Mary in restful listening adoration? Ah, those misplaced priorities. Those encumbering weights that threw our lives off balance. Now where do these misplaced priorities come from? Misplaced priorities are symptoms of a deeper problem. Disordered affections. 
we have these misplaced priorities because we have wrongly ordered loves. Disordered affections lead to misplaced priorities. Do we prioritize time on social media while our Bibles gather dust on the shelf because we love the social media more than we love the Word of God? Disordered affection. Do we prioritize feeding our TV habit while we starve our prayer life because we love our TV shows more than we love communing with God? That's a disordered affection. Misplaced priorities are symptoms of a deeper problem. Disordered affections. Wrongly ordered love. So then, what do we need to do to rightly place our priorities? We need to rightly order our affections. Well, then that leads to yet another how question, doesn't it? How do we rightly order our affections? Here's how. To rightly order our affections, we need to stir up our affection for God so that we love God first and we love God most. Rightly ordered affections. Loving God first and loving God All other affections are ordered under the surpassing affection of loving God first. With all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength. And loving Him most. We saw a few moments ago in our assessment report that one of our church's strengths is passionate spirituality. Way to go, Hope Church. Let's be delighted to see that one of our strengths is passionate spirituality. God has given us a passionate spirituality. We really do love God. We do. I, I can sense that in our midst. We can build on that strength. Let's continually stir up a freshly passionate, vibrant, ongoing, full love for God. Amen. 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 We're on our way. How do we stir up a freshly passionate love for God? Not yesterday's love for God, but today's love for God. How do we stir that up? How do we keep it fresh and vibrant? We stir up our love for God by meditating upon His love for us. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. Open up God's love for us. There we read. For while we were still helpless, we were helpless. We were unable to rescue ourselves. At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Hmm. For one will hardly die for a righteous person, though perhaps. For the good person, someone would even dare to die. But, but, God demonstrates his own love toward us. And that while we were still sinners, 
Christ died for us. We stir up our love for God by meditating on His love for us. And how does God show His love for us? While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still ungodly, Christ died for us. While we were still in rebellion against God, shaking our fist in heaven, Christ died for us. <coughs> While we were still turning away from God, running away from Him, wanting to set our own course, do our own thing, go our own way, the hound of heaven pursued us with all deliberate speed until He captured us in His net of grace in his embrace of mercy Christ died for us while we were helpless unable to rescue ourselves like a drowning person in the middle of the ocean with no boat no life preserver Christ tossed us his life preserver the cross. We were helpless. We were sinners. We were ungodly. We were running from him. We were disobeying him. And yet, the Father sent his Son to die for us. In other words, God demonstrates his love for us and that the God of love loved the unloved. He saw our sin, he saw our guilt, he saw our shame, he saw our rebellion, he saw our running away, he saw our helplessness, and he nailed it. He nailed it on the cross. And that's God's love for us that he demonstrates to us. And when we fully grasp God's love for us and how he has demonstrated that love our hard hearts are melted melted into a puddle of love for God and this is how we rightly order our affections to step through it again in the other direction as we meditate upon God's love for us we will stir up our love for God so that we grow 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 in loving him first loving him most with a vibrant full love for God and as we grow in loving God first and most all of our other affections will be rightly ordered under the surpassing affection of loving God first and most and as we rightly order our affections, we will rightly place our priorities because priorities stem from affections. And as we rightly place our priorities, we will lay aside those misplaced priorities that encumber us in the marathon of faith. We've cast off the weight, praise the Lord. But there's something else we need to lay aside. That is the sin that so easily entangles us. Let us lay aside, the text tells us, the sin which so easily entangles us. In other words, it doesn't take much for us to get entangled by sin. Pretty easy for sin to do that. I learned when I ran my Disney Marathon that a marathoner ought not to run with untied shoes. <laughs> Those flopping shoelaces on the course, well, they tend to entangle the runner. Sin can be like that. Untied shoelaces 
entangling us, stripping us of. So we need to take care of that. Is there a sin that's tripping you up in your marathon of faith? Perhaps it's a sin of unbelief. Pride. That's the one I struggle with. Lust. Greed for the world's allurements. If only I had just a little more. One that trips so many of us up. Anger. Not the anger that's fresh from being cut off in traffic, but the, the anger that's harbored anger. The anger that has been anchored in the harbor of your soul for so long that the anchor has rusted and it's become a grudge. Resentment. Bitterness. That can really trip us up in our marathon of faith. We can't lay this aside on our own effort. We're helpless for it. We need help. And that help comes from the Holy Spirit. When we put our faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit indwells us, and over time, as we walk in the Spirit, or run in the Spirit, He ties our shoelaces back up. He makes us more like Christ. He lays aside those entangling sins in our lives. We run in the Spirit. So let's train to make godly choices and run on straight paths. So, what have we seen so far? We've seen that to run with endurance, the marathon of faith, we need to throw off hindrances, whether they be misplaced priorities that encumber us or sins that entangle us. To put it succinctly, we've got to run far, so let's run light. Let's lighten up. Throw off those hindrances. As we do so, let's run with endurance as we fix our eyes on Moving on through Hebrews 12 to the end of verse 1 and into verse 2. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. God has set the race before us. God has set the course. We need to run with endurance because we see the course stretching out in a long distance run. It, this is a dead sprint. This is a long distance run. We need endurance. But as we see the course stretching out, that's not all we see. The eye of faith sees Jesus at the finish line. So let's run the marathon of faith with endurance as we fix our eyes on Jesus who awaits us at the finish line. I ran track in junior high school. Well, say I'll be honest, I'm, that was a little evangelistically speaking. I, I, I sat on the bench. You know, somebody has to do it, right? In, uh, in junior high school. But, but one of the coaches kept nailing us in us. When you're running, look at the finish line. Set your eyes on the finish line. Don't look anywhere else. Don't look at the scenery. Don't pick the roses. Don't look at the other runners. 
look at the finish line. Don't look backwards. Look forwards. Look at the finish line. The eye of faith sees Jesus at the finish line. Let's run the marathon of faith with endurance. As we fix our eyes on Jesus, he's waiting for us at the finish line. Amen? Amen. 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 Now, Jesus is the author of faith. Jesus is the pioneer who has opened the way to God for us when he ran his race through the course of his cross. He opened the way for us. And Jesus is also the perfecter of faith. He completes the way of faith. For he has entered into heaven's holy of holies as the forerunner who brings us into God's presence. Isn't this something? Jesus is both the author and the perfecter of faith. In other words, Jesus is the starting line of faith. And Jesus is the finish line of faith. We run a marathon where the starting line and the finish line are in the same place. The person of Jesus. Jesus starts us on our marathon. He strengthens us to run with endurance. And he brings us across the finish line into the presence of God. So where do we fix our eyes? Jesus. The pioneer of faith, the perfecter of faith, the starting line, the finish line. We pass our gaze on him as we run the marathon of faith. You know, as we run the long race, we tend to look down at the challenge of the course itself. The challenge of the course itself. Too much month at the end of the money, even in February. That demanding boss. That chronic illness. That's where we tend to look, isn't it? We tend to look at the challenges of the course itself. We need to, to look upward, my brothers and sisters. We tend to fix our eyes on COVID while it's striking and inflation while it's spiking. But COVID has no beauty. No beauty on which to fix our eyes. And the price at the pump has no glory. No glory on which to fix our gaze. Jesus, oh Jesus, is worthy of our gaze. His cross of grace and love is the beauty of beauties on which to fix our eyes. His majesty at the right hand of the throne of God is the glory of glories on which to rivet our gaze. So let's fix our eyes on Jesus, the author of faith at the cross and the perfecter of faith at the throne. Amen? Amen. Amen. So then, my friends, we're in a marathon. It's a long distance. We need endurance. How do we find endurance? for that race I've set before us. We need to throw off hindrances. We need to get rid of the weights. Whether they be the weights that encumber us or the sins that entangle us. Let's run with endurance as we fix our eyes on the finish line. On Jesus. Let's draw endurance for our race from the endurance of him who ran his race all the way up the hill of cross and shame. All the way across the finish line. The finish line of glory at the right hand of the Father's throne. 
when we get rid of encumbrances and entangling sins, when we fix our eyes on Jesus, then we can run with endurance the race that is set before us, this marathon, mile by mile by mile by mile by mile by mile, all the way fixing our eyes on Jesus until we cross the finish line and collapse safely into nail-pierced hands and hear the voice of Jesus saying, Welcome home, runner. Receive the prize prepared for you before the foundation Jesus, you set us on a course, and you are the starting line and you're the finish line, and you started us out. And Lord, sometimes we grow weary, we grow faint, and we feel like we're not going to make it. Our legs become like spaghetti. But we look unto you, Lord Jesus, we see you on the standing line. Your eye riveted upon us, your hand beckoning out toward us, beckoning us to endure, to run. May we run with endurance. May we fix our eyes on you. Drawing from your strength, for you ran your course all the way through the cross to the throne. Lord, we look forward to someday crossing that finish line, collapsing into your arms. And until that day, give us the endurance that we need. In your name, Lord Jesus. And Lord, as we're about now to cross over into our fellowship meal, even as the early church broke bread together, we give you thanks. Ask that you would bless the meal to our nourishment and the conversation, to our building up of the faith, to our fixing our eyes on you. In Christ's name.